late starting. So Sue is going to talk to us about positive birth experience for long-term benefit, the right care, the right time and the right relationships. Thanks a million, Sue. Thanks, Joan. Um, it, I've got a little sign here. It says you cannot share screen while the other participant is sharing. So I don't know whether that's gone away or not. Um, I'll just can try, you try. Can you try again now, Sue? Yeah, okay. That looks like that's working. So, um, yeah, I'm really sorry I can't be there with you. And I you know, absolutely understand that people are uh, you know, <laughs> catching up. Um, I think, so I'm, I'm now hearing that, is that right? I need to finish by 10 to 10. Is that right? 10 is fine, Sue. So 10 is fine. 10 is okay. okay. It's I just might... that 10 to 10, the president will be arriving, so she'll be hearing the last bit of your lecture. So, no, don't worry. Oh, okay, that's yeah. fine. Right, let me just find my uh, presentation again. So I'll cut it down a little bit then, but not quite so much. So of course I had this, I had the uh, presentation right ready there and now it isn't. So let me just uh, track it down through another route. I'm assuming I'm showing my screen now. Yeah, can everybody see my screen? Just checking. Let me know if you can't, because I'm assuming I you can. Yes, you can. Yes, yes, we can see your emails. Yeah. Yes, in my emails. Yes. <laughs> and uh, now, how yes. How many hundreds of thousands of emails we have? <laughs> right, so um, I'll skip through the first bit relatively quickly. So I'm just putting it onto full screen here. Yes, um, it's very visible. So what I was going to do was just to um, summarize what, what I said when I gave a presentation in this kind of same similar area at the beginning of the cost action. So it's really, as with all these cost actions, really phenomenal to find ourselves at this point, isn't it? With all the work that's been achieved in this particular one, which has been amazing. So I'll just go very quickly through this because this was what I already said uh, a few years ago, just to um, demonstrate where we're at really, what's happened and what hasn't happened in the interim. So the, the business of overdiagnosis is an issue around the world, not just for maternity care, but also for uh, general areas of healthcare. And again, I presented this idea of overdiagnosis and the negative consequences of it in 2020. So um, we're still dealing with that now, I think, aren't we? And this is, this is a more recent example than the one I gave before, which is Peristat Europe. And you can, I don't know how clearly you can see your countries down here. What you can definitely see is the difference between cesarean section rates in orange and instrumental birth in blue around the world. And as before, Cyprus is massively um, larger rates than many other countries for, and other countries like Sweden, much lower rates. And the perinatal mortality rates don't necessarily align with these differences in cesarean section, that is, High cesarean section rates don't necessarily align Sim with them. Oh, can I hear some chat in the back? Can you hear me? Okay. I can hear somebody talking. Is that, can you hear me? You can? Okay, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. So a difference, uh, low cesarean section rates don't necessarily cor sometimes correlate with low perinatal mortality rates and vice versa. Not always, but sometimes. And last time we also went over, and I know that the action has been de dealing with this as well, with um, epigenetic consequences. And this is a study that, that um, I talked about last time, where there was a, a comparison between lecture cesarean section of vaginally born infants and the outcomes in terms of the epigenetic phenomena that were manifest. And I know that you know various people have been looking at the notion of both epigenetics and the microbiome over the last four years, which has been brilliant. Um, this was a, a, a conclusion from that particular study in 2014. And what's fascinating is there's been so little evidence since. Very few people are still are engaging with this topic. There was a big flurry around 2015 or so up to 2000 and not much since. So it's still a wide open field for analysis. In this particular study, um, they, they found phenomena that did seem to be correlated with uh, the, the, the empirical finding that type, two, type one diabetes in, in under five-year-olds seem to be increased with elective cesarean section from a very low base. You know, obviously the, the instance is very low, but an increase of about 20%. And this particular study seemed to explain why that might be from an epigenetic perspective. And it also found that um, women who had shorter labors had similar, seemed to have, the babies seemed to have similar epigenetic changes or lack of changes um, to those who had elective cesarean section, suggesting that labor does something important. And, you know, again, I, I don't think it'll be a surprise to people that they, there's a whole range of um, <coughs> autoimmune phenomena that have been linked <coughs> that have been linked to mode of birth and maybe specifically to physiological birth. That is, not having physiological birth seems to have some kind of relationship with these phenomena, although some studies 
dispute this finding. So it's still a very wide open area, as I've said. And then we also last time did actually look at the look at what happened with induction of labor. And, and again, there is some evidence from animal studies, again, not really repeated recently, indicated that perhaps induction of labor might have some similar effects <clears throat> and therefore suggesting that physiological labor and birth is the is the important um, aspect, not necessarily elective, uh, you know, the other modes of birth. Subsequent to uh, the presentation last time, we have published a paper that actually looked at um, what happened following induction of healthy women with no risk factors in the children up to the age of 16 years. And I think for me, one of the most interesting, interesting findings was higher rates of admission to hospital for infections up to the age of 16 years in um, babies that had been induced in, for no obvious medical reason in healthy women when you control for all the other kinds of factors that might get in the way of that. Again, this is not saying that induction should never be done. It's not saying cesarean should never be done for individuals <clears throat> because on an individual level, it matters very often, uh, whether that's by choice or by need, but it's saying that at a population level, we may be risking an increase. We may be running at risk of an increased risk of public, pu of public health issues in the longer term if we don't support physio physiological labor and birth where that's wanted and needed and possible. Moving to the microbiome, this is um, data from the longitudinal Teddy study showing a difference in certain in, um, in bacterioids in um, babies born by cesarean section versus vaginal birth. And again, I don't think this will be a surprise. What they did actually find though in this particular study uh, published in Nature was that the largest effect in terms of different bacterial colonization in the baby's gut was to do with breastfeeding. So the combination of mode of birth and breastfeeding seems to be really important here as well. The other, the other study, which I think we did talk about last time, was this very interesting one. I know you can't read all the detail here because I'm going to go through it quickly. But basically what it found is it, it comparing babies born at home with those born in hospital, spontaneous onset, no antibiotics, no water birth, um, basically everything completely the same in hospital and home. There was a difference in colonization of particular um, bacteria, uh, you know, positive bacteria in the babies born at home versus hospital. So um, again, there seems to be something about the environment that the baby, the mother and the baby is kind of used to or, or grows up in or developed in whatever that seems to be um, make a difference to what happens to mother and baby during labor and birth. <coughs> I'm not gonna go through these ones in detail, as I say, because I think you know about it, I'm just gonna flip through them, but this notion of positive pregnancy, labor, birth, postnatal experience. Um, so although it's important to look at trauma and this action has done a lot of very, very important work around trauma, we have to keep in mind that again, the positive experience really matters to mothers and babies. And in, this is far more than just satisfaction. This is delight, elation, you know, positive changes that really at the minute within many, many maternity health systems, we are completely forgetting. So this was the data from the original study um, in this field, which was around positive labor, uh, positive pregnancy experience done for WHO, looking at these things as being important and hypothesizing that this relates to Maslow's hierarchy of needs where actually we're just focusing on safety and physiological needs and we're forgetting all this other stuff that actually really matters in terms of mothers and babies and families and birthing people in, and society into the longer term. This is the intrapartum data, giving birth to a healthy baby, clinically, psychologically safe environment, emotional support from competent, reassuring, kind staff. Physiological birth, though the need to go with the flow was acknowledged and many women you know, didn't were happy to have interventions if they needed or wanted it as long as they were kept in the loop about what was happening and had a hand in the in the decision making. And there's a, been a subsequent review uh, by I think members of this action um, summarizing this notion of what a positive childbirth experience is. So her, her experience of interactions and events that make her feel supported, in control, safe, respected. And it's about being joyful, confident and accomplished with longer term positive impacts so and more than just what happens during the labor and birth itself. And then subsequently, we published another review about the postnatal period, um, reinforcing what's been done before, basically. So adapt adaption to uh, self-identity, competence as mother, changes in their um, circumstances, so being able to adapt and be resilient to changes in their circumstances, being able to navigate ordinary physical, physical and emotional challenges. And this relates to the, to the critique of over-diagnosis of um, ordinary challenging psychological experiences as trauma. And I'm sure this has been, and I know this has been debated within this action, that we shouldn't over, over diagnose ordinary um, emotional roller coasters and ups and downs as trauma. 
And many women actually report some parts of their birth as being traumatic while also reporting their birth as being a positive experience. And sometimes, you know, facing one's demons and dealing with things that are really difficult can actually result in a really positive sense of self-achievement. So we have to make sure that we don't, we don't um, you know, factor that out in our studies when we only focus on the particular components that women in birth find or report as being difficult and then interpreting that as, as um, fundamentally traumatic. And experience the dynamic achievement of personal growth as they adjust to the new normal of motherhood in their own cultural context. So these, these reviews altogether look at this whole continuum from the beginning to the end. And many women don't conceptualize it as different. They see the whole thing as a, as a psychological continuum resulting in hopefully that positive outcome. But we don't really measure this. So the study that was published by um, one of our PhD students, um, Gillianne McKel McKelvin recently basically could find very little evidence of the literature concerning positive experiences and most variables are still pathogenic. And we need to get beyond that. So beyond the too little, too late, too much, too soon into something which actually is much more balanced. So turning to the UK context, because um, you know, G Joan particularly asked me to look at this because there are some quite interesting and um, difficult challenges in the, U in the UK at the minute. So the vision of the Better Births Government Policy, and again, I don't expect you to read all this, but the vision is for services to be kinder, more personalized, more family friendly, with more information where women can access support, delivering care which is women-centered and you know, we're in high performing teams with basically competent and caring staff. That's what we're supposed to be doing. I mean, and that's been our uh, policy in the UK for a number of years now. But what's actually happening in the UK is our cesarean section rates are going up dr quite dramatically compared to the rest of the world. So the, the colors here in, uh, from this particular study um, in bold show uh, the dark green is, uh, the, so the, the red is the UK. This is the change in the UK. Um, and the green is England going up here. And this blue is the average non-UK countries here. So you can see that you know from 2014 onwards, our cesarean section rates in the UK um, are rising very dramatically compared to those in Europe, whereas the rest of Europe is either lateral in equalizing, stabilizing, or decreasing in many cases. And that's a really interesting phenomenon. And this is another um, uh, graph or graphic figure from the same paper showing the correlation between perinatal mortality and cesarean section. So here you can see Norway and Finland, low cesarean section rate, low perinatal mortality rate. France, relatively median um, cesarean section rate, but high perinatal mortality. And then here, a kind of bunch of countries, including uh, the uh, GP, high, very high and very high rates of cesarean section, and not necessarily low rates of perinatal mortality. So this whole question arises about what is going on here. Recently, we had a, a we set up a network of maternity service researchers, mostly midwives in the northwest of England, and. The group in the in the uh, in that uh, meeting who were mid clinical midwives who were interested in research reported that all these things are now happening in the UK, which is a reversal from what was happening before. This is going backwards. So VE without fully informed consent, no interpreters present, lithotomy for spontaneous birth, membrane sweep, no consent, no eating and drinking in labour, no mobilising, enforced pushing. I uh, can't read that one because actually it's off my screen. Let's just have a look. Yeah, induction, so lots of things happening without consent, but also lots of um, phenomena, lots of practices happening that, you know, we have known for almost 40 years we should not be doing, and yet we are going back to doing them. Why is this? There are toxic environments, and you know, a number of you will have known about the various reviews that have been going on in the UK um, that have found a whole load of problems. This is the most recent one. So um, I won't read this first. Well, I will read this first quote, actually. I work in um, this particular place. I'm ashamed to say I feel intimidated at work. I've made to feel stupid. I feel completely unsupported by senior staff. I dread going to work with certain people. Management are not approachable. There's a blame culture. Slog your guts out. It's okay for a face fits. We operate one rule for one and another for everybody else. At times, it's an awful place to be. So what I think has changed from the, the conversation that was happening four years ago, <laughs> when I was talking about why we're not able to do positive labour and birth or why we should, is a focus on how staff are feeling and what's happening to staff and the kinds of negativity that are surrounding staff, not just in the UK, but elsewhere, but specifically, I think, in the UK at the moment, this is really problematic. And part of it is to do with the social media conversation that's happening. This is a recent um, 
a headline from one of our one of our papers in the UK, widely read papers. And when it talks about quack remedies being peddled by NHS midwives and the obsession with natural birth, it's talking about aromatherapy and massage and those kinds of, um, if you like, complementary therapies, which women love, which, which midwives have been providing for a long time, for which there's no particular evidence of harm, even if there's no particular evidence of benefit. And basically what it's saying is we should not be using or offering any of these remedies for women. Um, they, they should really basically be having epidurals and, you know, and those kinds of things and not these kinds of things. So this is, this is just typical of the kind of dialogue that's going on in the social media. This is one that um, Joan asked me to talk about specifically. So this was our conference on normal birth, um, which we were heavily criticized for, for a number of reasons. This is the International Normal Labour and Birth Research Conference, um, which has been going since, since 2001. And we were heavily um, criticized on social media and in one particular uh, newspaper, but it previously we have been in a whole range of newspapers for other, other events we've been doing. Um, where we had asked, we had asked Bill Kirkup, who was the author of a, a critical report into maternity services, to come and talk to us about what was a problem, um, you know, and why normal physiological labour and birth might be a problem. And he was uh, pressured into pulling out of that conference because a group of people who had lost their babies, very sadly lost their babies and treat, been treated badly, thought he should not be there because we promoted this dangerous ideology of normal physiological labour and birth. And I could talk a lot more about that, but I won't because of the time. So what, when does normalising birth as dangerous and traumatic become a normal social mental model? And what are the consequences? So this is just a, again, I showed this last time, a headline from a US woman saying that normal birth traumatised her. But in this case, this woman was actually induced. So you could argue whether normal labour and birth is actually, or physiological labour and birth is actually what she was um, talking about she actually talks about an unmedicated natural birth and this is her induction of labor so we're potentially normalizing something which is not actually physiological as as physiological which raises a whole raised range of um, issues so this is um, looking at maternal experiences of um, childbirth and postnatal expectations of behavior so basically, a subjective experience seemed to matter more so than um, the actual place and the mode of birth. Social support enhanced the experience and further support, this offers further support for the importance of making childbirth a positive experience because it actually influenced the way that women felt about their baby's um, early behavior and temperament. So it has a, and, it, and again, I, I don't need to tell anybody in this audience, I don't think how important labor and birth and the experiences are in terms of future well-being of mothers and babies. Um, this is a recent, a kind of relatively recent study on triggers for traumatic birth. And basically, the, one of the questions in the survey was describe the birth trauma experience and what you found traumatizing. And they did a thematic analysis process. And there were four themes, the care provided, disregarding embodied knowledge of women, women experiencing what they, what they felt to be lies and threats and violation. The point being that, you know, very often changing the way women feel about their labour and birth experiences in the hands of staff. But if staff are also feeling traumatised, it's really difficult to know how that is going to be operationalised. So it's what we do, not what not labour and birth itself. Women felt that care providers prioritised their own agendas, resulting in unnecessary intervention. Women became learning resources for staff and their embodied knowledge was disregarded because of the uh, care providers' clinical assessments. And this is, this, is the word, this is from the data. So care providers used lies and threats and coercion related to the well-being of the baby. Women described actions of, that were abusive and violent, and these were caught, triggered memories of sexual assault. So the problem is relating to what I was saying earlier on, that you know, what women then describe as traumatic birth then becomes reified into birth is traumatic. Whereas in fact, it's actually not the birth itself or the labor and birth itself. It's the way that we do labor and birth that actually creates these, these norms. But unfortunately, if women believe that it's actually birth itself, then the only recourse they have arguably is to elective cesarean section because you know, otherwise they're exposing themselves to something which ultimately they're gonna find traumatic. So create, we create a scenario in which the only choice women can make is either, well, either home birth without, without, um, without attendance, free birthing, or uh, elective caesarean, because otherwise they're gonna be exposed. So 
we did a, a big review um, for WHO um, looking at all published language and literature in all languages in all of health and social care to find out what actually was underpinning abusive care, if you like, across the piece recently published. And we found two adverse consequences. Firstly, social normalization of violence. This could be sexual, emotion, emotional, verbal, whatever, especially for other groups, and obviously, especially for women, or, or you know, women being one of the other groups that, we're, that we might be um, talking about here, but other, other groups too, in, in terms of um, race, sexual orientation, you know, disability, et cetera. And then, interestingly, the belief that mistreatment is necessary to minimize clinical harm, that actually staff felt they had to do things that they knew were abusive because that was how they would minimize adverse harm from mothers and babies. It was basically in the best interests of mothers and babies. And this seems to be one of the areas that we could really start to unpick within our services. And this seems to result in these kinds of phenomena. So bystander behavior. So if you see things happening that we know to be you know, problematic and harmful for women and babies, we just ignore it because we believe it's in the woman's best interest or the person is doing it in the best interest. Toxic environments that create people who are difficult to work with and vice versa. And personal circumstances for the care provider, any of these things. So death of a loved one, divorce, moving. You know, sometimes we, we assume that people are behaving, behaving the way they do because they're just, um, they are fundamentally abusive or they're burnt out or whatever. But it could be that they have a whole load of things going on in their lives that we don't really understand that we should be work, we should be trying to understand for them miscommunication and again we don't really have time to do this exercise but some people see this picture as a young woman some see it as an old lady some can see both but it's the same picture and if we're not if we're not able to see through the eyes of the other then we can't communicate well um, either with you know fellow staff or those we manage if we manage people or with the women we care for the uh, different mental models that people have about what evidence and safety and personalization is. And again, I don't really have time to unpack this, but we do, when we use, when I say safety and you say safety, we think we're saying the same thing, but maybe we're not. You know, we have to maybe unpack what we mean by that. Otherwise we're gonna get miscommunication. Anticipation of humili hum humiliation and bullying. You know, people in those, those kinds of toxic environments I just talked to you about, who actually behave as, the way, as they do because they think otherwise they're gonna get bullied or humiliated. So women end up, women and birthing people end up being the victims of that because they, you know, in the hierarchical systems. We all know about this fear of blame and litigation and making mistakes and just having an empty emotional tank, you know, just, just having nothing left in the tank to be able to give to people. The more recent um, review in the UK actually was making this turn towards the positive, however, and I'm gonna try and make a turn towards the positive in my last kind of 15 minutes here. So um, what they said is actually, we need to identify poorly performing units. We need to give care with compassion and kindness. We need to respond to challenge with honesty and we need team working with a common purpose. And so this is, the government has accepted these findings. So it'd be interesting to see whether we are able to turn the, turn the, the kind of um, the uh, super tanker of the NHS around towards this way of thinking and behaving. Because actually, if we get this right for staff, it's very likely we're gonna get it right for service users as well. And again, coming back to the paper I was telling you about, about the disrespectful uh, disrespect and abuse um, and why it happens in health and social care that we just published. We were interested in all of in the, the various theories underpinning this at all levels. So culture, policies, community, interpersonal, individual, but acknowledging that each of these levels is made up of human beings, individuals, people. So although we talk about the system, the system is us and we have to get it right for us. And the theory of planned behavior kind of explains that a bit. And I'm quite keen on this theory as those who know me will know, although I know that psychologists have criticized it. But I think whenever I've looked at this, it seems to be true that we, we are guided by three beliefs. Basically, will I get any benefit if I do this thing? Whether I'm a manager, whether I'm a CEO of a company, whether I'm the government minister, you know, all levels of a system, will I get a benefit if I make the differences that are being asked for here? What's everybody else doing around me? Because I want to do what everybody else does. And basically, is it easy for me to do it? And it seems to me that if we make changes at all levels of a system that make it beneficial, normal practice and easy for individuals to behave in ways that are going to make a difference, then we're going to make that difference. And I'm going to just you know, talk a little bit for 10 minutes about what those things might be. So one of them might be moving from power over an asymmetrical relationship towards power to, where the actor themselves, the person themselves can carry out certain outcomes, and then power with, the ability of a group to act together in co about collective um, goals. 
And it might well be that some of the research we might do to close the evidence practice gap might be about moving from power over to power two. So, you know, doing these things here to actually create a change at a cultural level, at a, at a kind of organizational level. And I don't know if any of you have ever seen Ted Lasso, it's a, it's a TV series, but if you haven't, I would recommend it because there's some brilliant lessons in Ted Lasso about how you might move from this power over towards power two. This is, again, I know you can't read this, but this is a programme undertaken in, in Monash in, the U, in Australia during, during COVID because they realised that um, obstetricians and gynaecologists were, feeling, were very burnt out. And so they put in place a kindness programme to make sure that their staff were, were you know, um, um, optimised, their staff wellbeing was optimised. And if we look at some of the recent data on the psychobiological impact of kindness and compassion, we can see why it's important. So, you know, positive interpersonal connection, decreased mortality and markers of better health in general. We're not just talking maternity here. And actually simply seeing kindness and caring activates the neuro neuropsychology of kindness, which is a really fascinating thing, not just doing it, but seeing it done. So, you know, as a, as a role model, doing kindness and compassion can actually change the psychobiology of people around you. This particular study was around a pediatric dental clinic where people were ran who were parents were uh, randomized were attending and so while they were waiting watching either normal children's programs or um, some positive videos um, quite small numbers and they found the ones who watched the kindness media the positive videos had a significant increase in feeling inspired moved touched happy calmer more grateful and less irritated just watching while they were waiting these kindness videos they seemed to be more optimistic and less anxious and all those who were involved in the study were offered an honorarium and given the opportunity to give the money to charity or to keep it. And those who watched the kindness videos, 85% um, donated their donated to charity versus 54% of those who just watched the standard. This is a very dramatic um, influence. I'm going to just skip this slide. Well, no, I'm not. I'm just going to go to the next one to look at the kinds of uh, neurohormonal neuro impacts. So of social support and you know i'm equating social support with kindness and care here but you know that's a big equation but still lower um catecholamine levels a reduction in immune mediated inflammatory processes and cytokine production impact on natural killer cell activity so you know protection from infection and, and recovery quicker opioids and oxytocin increase in opioids and oxytocin production so you know obviously very relevant for the for our maternity care so in my final 10 minutes, this is a really rapid run. Through. <laughs> so, you know, my apologies if, if it's been difficult to keep up, but you can look at the slides afterwards, obviously, because I think you'll have access to them. So I want to talk about how we make this happen then at a systems level. And I want to talk about the potential for safety to thinking. And some of you may have heard about this. So safety one, safety two. Um, this theory and again I know you can't read the text here particularly as it does at the minute but is around unintended consequences and opportunity costs so the, the idea that actually safety one thinking the, the current thinking that we operate in this extremely risk averse society that we live in where um, where the kind of avoidance of anticipated regret is such a big part of our, our mental models and which is so influential in those kinds of negative environments that I was talking to you about in you know beforehand basically what this this um, slide illustrates is that safety one focuses here on the, the the things that go wrong which are a very small percentage of the overall way that overall amount of things that we do within healthcare so very you know very the vast majority of the time things go right this part of the normal distribution curve but we focus here and the trouble is that what we do is we focus here we find one thing goes wrong we have a huge maternity review like we have done in the UK. OK, there were a series of things that went wrong in those hospitals, but still. And but but, but you know, we we then say, OK, here's a solution. And we apply that solution to the whole of this part of the care that we provide, where in fact things were, were actually going right. And in applying the thing the, the solution to the things that go wrong to everywhere else, we actually disrupt what goes right creating the kinds of problems I've just been talking about and potentially increasing risk for women and, and um, service users and, and also for staff and also for organizations. And this has been, this idea has been taken up by, for example, the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. So it's not a completely, um, it's not completely off, off the wall. There's a lot of people that are beginning to engage with this idea because we keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again by focusing only on safety one. 
51 safety two doesn't say you must forget things that go wrong. That's really, we have to still focus, we have to still make sure that we monitor and adapt to those things, or adapt, you know, make changes happen. So we don't create risk in the system or we don't um, perpetuate risk in the system, but we also must be aware of the unintended consequences of disrupting what goes right because that creates more risk in the future. The other um, important idea to think about in terms of safety one, safety two, is the notion of workers imagined that is, what's in the protocols, what's in the guidelines, what's in the rules and regulations, the things that we imagine we're supposed to be doing, and actually work has done, what we actually do every day, flexing, nuancing, adapting, to make sure that we can deliver what's required for individual mothers and babies and service users and staff in the minute, which is not necessarily what's workers imagine. It's not necessarily what's in the protocols, guidelines, rules, etc. What works for populations doesn't always work for individuals. And this here, work has done, is what makes things safe and positive where it where it's allowed to happen, with competent, caring, skilled people who know the guidelines but can adapt and flex them for individuals on the ground in the <coughs> messy dynamics of um, of maternity care. And this actually also links with, with complex adaptive systems models. That I think some of you in the action have been, have been um, working with. And there are examples where this has really worked. So things do not go well because people simply follow the procedures of work as imagined. Things go well because people make sensible adjustments according to the demands of a situation. Work has done. Um, so I'm not, again, I'm not gonna read this quote, you know, Positive relationships are the, equal the best outcomes for each mother and baby and for the staff working in the services, informed by evidence, but tailored to them, what works for them. And the place to start is with us to make this happen. Um, compassionate and humble leadership really matters. And if we set the tone and role model, others will follow. That is the end. I, I do actually have a three minute video here. I don't know if I can actually make it work. Um, I, so we could either show the video or if it's time I could take some questions if there are any or, or thoughts and uh, again my apologies that was such a quick romp through so just should I show the video or take some questions or just stop. <laughs> I can't hear anything so I don't know what I don't know what the best uh, action is here. Thanks for a fascinating uh, talk. <laughs> it's a lot to observe. Uh, thank you. So I'm assuming that means I won't show the video. Um, so if you want to, if, if you get the slides afterwards and you want to, do have a look at this. It's really fascinating. Or it's really uplifting, actually, not fascinating. It's an uplifting video that's really worth looking at. Sue, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, I can. Uh, so we were wondering if you would uh, try the video, see if it okay. would play, and then we might still be able to get a few questions and do both. Okie dokie, I'll see, it'll probably play my end, it's just whether it will show your end, I think. Okay. Let's see. Um, so I, might, I might have had to change some settings to make it do that. I think it, is it coming through your end? It's beginning to load my end. It, it looks like it's loading. So we have the lady's image. I think it'll probably play. We just need to check if we've got sound. Yeah, it might be the sound issue. Let's just see when, it, when it's um, loaded up. It's really about climate change, but it, it makes the point that, you know, each individual can make a difference effectively. Brilliant. Okay. Yeah, constant. Can you hear that? Yeah, we can hear it. Right. They're being bombarded by problems that we face. And sometimes we can get completely overwhelmed. The story of the hummingbird is about this huge problem being consumed by the fire. All the animals in the forest come out and they are transfixed as they watch the forest burning. And they feel very overwhelmed, very powerless except this thing coming it says i'm going to do something about the fire so it flies to the nearest stream takes a drop of water and it puts it on the fire and goes up and down up and down up and down as fast as it can 
in the meantime, all the other animals, much bigger animals like the elephant with a big trunk could bring much more water. They are standing there helpless and they are saying to the hummingbird, what do you think you can do? You're too little. This fire is too big. Your wings are too little. And you're big, so small. You can only bring a small drop of water at a time. But as they continue to discourage it, it turns to them without wasting any time and tells them, I'm doing the best I can. And that to me is what all of us should do. We should always feel like a hummingbird. I may feel insignificant, but I certainly don't want to be like the animals watching as the planet goes down the drain. I will be a hummingbird. I will do the best I can. So the, the metaphor, if you like, and the idea there is that, you know, each of us in our research area might feel, sorry, these are my emails coming in. I should, I should turn that sound off. Um, <clears throat> might feel that we can't do very much. Our little research project isn't gonna get it very far, but each of us doing our research project to try and turn this tide towards a more positive, kinder way of doing maternity, a kinder, more compassionate way of doing maternity care has an influence in the longer run as we all build together to a program of work that hopefully will have an impact on the ground. And of course, those of us who are clinical practitioners can be doing that you know, in our everyday work as well. So you know, if we can all work together as managers, practitioners, uh, funders, you know funding research that works in this way, and then translating it through implementation science into something that actually does make a change happen. And, you know, complexity theory would, would argue that eventually there'll be a tipping point if enough of us do that. So we can actually turn that super tank around really quickly so that we don't have this trauma and we do have far more women, the vast majority, and babies <clears throat> and birthing people and families and societies moving towards this kind of positive space that's generated by really good um, pregnancy, birth and postnatal experiences. So any questions if we have time? Thank you everybody for listening. <laughs> Oops, sorry, I'll stop that. <laughs> Trying to escape. Sorry, Sue, we're just changing microphones. <laughs> uh, Marie Healy has a question. Hi, Sue, thanks so much. Um, as always, a really inspirational, um, up, up, uh, beat, uh, you know, evidenced, up-to-date evidence uh, you're presenting is fabulous. Thank you. Just a couple of comments, really, as you're most likely aware, and I've spoken to you before about the guidelines for admission to midwife-led units in Northern Ireland, that they were pulled after, you know, an unfortunate instant. Um, and all of a sudden, as you said, you know, you know, one instant in, in relation to the graft, you said right at the very, very beginning. And then for and it was working so well, those guidelines and translated into different languages. And all of a sudden, the whole aspect has turned around completely. Guidelines pulled, um, home birth guidelines pulled. And we've now a review, <laughs> a midwifery review now, which to, to an extent is great. And there's a really fantastic uh, chairperson there. So, yeah, exactly. You're just saying that. Um, I don't know what's going to come out of it, but uh, hopefully it'll make a difference. Continue to go back and, and have a look and see if we can continue to implement these uh, for, for women. Um, I really um, want to also make a comment about the, the video that you showed about making a small difference. And I had showed this to, to some uh, student midwives four years ago. It's mm. a really impactful video. Um, and uh, one week after showing the video, one student came in with a tattoo of a hummingbird in her arm. 
<laughs> and one like one week later, another student came in with a, a tattoo of a hummingbird in her arm. So it's really uplifting. <laughs> Thanks so much again. So you're very welcome. Sheen introduced me to the video, so I can't take credit. So we can't hear you now. Oh. Have you got probably because of your emails, your your speakers off? Is it? No. No. See you. <laughs> huh? You're I think you're muted, Sue, from your end. No? Say something. Hello. No. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, you know, I was just gonna just gonna say thank you very much, Maria. And yeah, I mean hopefully that review will, will work out well for you all. And uh, yes, I can't take credit for the video. Sheena, oh, uh, Sheena Byram introduced me to it. So um, yeah, and I think hopefully they had the tattoo and then they went away and they did the hummingbird thing and that will, that will make all the difference. Yeah. So can I just ask a question? Things are changing in Ireland from the legal point of view and there's now going to be a legal framework around open disclosure, which clinicians are terrified of. Because open disclosure has been focused on, I tell you about the mistake I made because otherwise you wouldn't have known I made it. But it's still not around, as you would be saying, the sort of the safety to model. So how do we try and combine both? So the open disclosure, the, you know, the, the reviews that have a more positive focus or a more constructive focus on context rather than just identifying the error and maybe putting another procedure in place to potentially protect it in the future? Yeah, it's a really, it's a really good point, a really good question. I mean, I guess it depends on, you know, anybody who has the ear of whoever, the, think about that socio-ecological model, you know, all the way from the, the top to the bottom. I think anybody identifying the individuals who have the power at each level of that, organ, of that um, model to make a change, is the, is the trick to this because very often there's one or two individuals at each level one or two government people maybe a civil servant who actually have or a civil servant who has the ear of a minister who actually are the person that can make the difference they are the one that can make things easy normal and beneficial and it it's really important to just keep our um antennae open i think to find out who it is that actually could have a conversation or you know talk to somebody in a coffee shop or whatever and change their mind so that they as powerful people can then actually make that you know in, infiltrate that into the conversation that's going on and um, you know I, I increasingly as I say I think it, we must stop talking about the system because it becomes something completely immovable but we have to think about the individuals in the system who are actually the ones who are going to make that change happen at that system level mm talk to them I mean you, I'm sure you know them Joan <laughs> whoever they are <laughs> exactly um yeah so that's amazing thank you we're just going to close this session now and invite her excellency the previous president of Malta to come and speak to us so Sue thanks very much on behalf of all of us uh lovely to see you have a great session I'm really sorry not to be there you know it's uh it's been a fantastic action so congratulations to everybody and to you Joan specifically yeah <laughs>